Mainstream media is huge. The way we get our news and our TV shows is changing dramatically. Over the last decade, we've seen folks cut the cord and go on social media or stream it using Apple TV, Roku, Amazon. The list goes on and on. And all the networks are headed that way. But have you ever wondered what the future holds in store for all these networks? Find out about where media is headed coming up next. I'm Eric Mitchell, and this is To The Point. Our vision of media has changed in the last decade, where we all grew up with three main channels, and then our premium networks are paid for, our cable news as we were raised on. Most of us remember when it was just CNN and MSNBC had this funky logo and showed up in a few mainstream movies and stuff like that, but it was always CNN. Most of us remember Desert Storm when it started. That was our go-to network. Some of us were raised on ABC News. Remember the nightly news with either Tom Brokaw or the late, great Peter Jennings. Or maybe you watched CBS and watched Dan Rather. Now, TV is everywhere with mainstream networks growing and smaller networks popping up built on social media platforms, depending on streaming on network TV or on our streaming shows like Apple, Roku, and Amazon, you're seeing more and more channels pop up like BuzzFeed and Cheddar TV and Newsmax and an amazing network called Bold TV, which has really changed the game. As a nonprofit network, it is putting on entrepreneurs into the forelight, into the front spot, in the spotlight, the front spotlight, into the spotlight and showing and giving them a voice. Their network is changing the game, built entirely off social media streaming. And that's the way we're going to go with it. And I think news is going to grow. And you're seeing the big monsters in the room start to copy that. Not just have their TV going on, but also focusing on their streaming acts. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, Fox Nation is a perfect example of that. Fox puts a lot of their talent on there. And amazing high-quality coverage is done on there. Not just the live shows that you've grown accustomed to, but also those shows. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Our guest today is going to cover a little bit of everything. Topics about how to pitch and where to pitch. Should you write the preamble to the Constitution when you're pitching people? And what is the future hold? And we also talk about election 2020 and how networks are going to handle this. So let's get to the point with our good friend and executive director at Bold TV, Mr. David Grasso. And welcome to the show, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Greetings from Midtown Manhattan, New York City. I love that skyline behind you. I am super jelly right now. I miss being in the city. I, I was hoping that Oregon would make the list of being forced to quarantine for 14 days in New York if I flew there because I'm tempted to fly there. I miss New York. I need a New York fix. I was just telling my wife, I was like, we were there in early March, right before all the shutdown occurred. And, you know, we've been there, Jan we were December, January, February, in there in March in our one of our favorite restaurants in Soho. And I really just, I need a New York fix. And it's... Uh... Well, uh, you know, I left for nine weeks. I was in Orlando, Florida, your hometown, yes. where my entire extended family lives. And we came back just in time for the protests and the looting. Uh, fortunately, that's calmed down. And these days, New York is slowly but surely getting better. Ah, well, that's good. It's good to see the city heal. It's good that they flatten the curve. Uh, we won't talk about Florida because their idea of flattening the curve is opposite of the rest of the world. So we'll we'll leave them alone. With their, I don't know what they're doing with their curve. I'm a I'm a proud native Floridian. I would love to live there if you know this city didn't provide me so many opportunities. Sure. So. I will refrain from making fun of Florida because I feel like there's enough people. Here. <laughs> I love I love native Floridians. We we're, we're either on one side of the table, you know, being from Orlando. You know, I love the city. I, I love, you know, I love that the bubble's there for our sports to get started. It looks like they're having fun. Although, I don't know if you saw it last night. Troy Daniels, an NBA player, showed his first meal at the 
at his hotel room. And it looks like something you would get at like a prison lunch. And he was like, yeah, it's going to be a long oh, time. If we're here for three months, this is going to be a long time. <laughs> so, Well, you know, we live on Disney property. We live in Celebration, which is right next to the wide world of sports where the NBA bubble and evidently uh, soccer bubble is yep. occurring. So we are looking forward to seeing a lot of the glitterati. I'm expecting some TMZ-like photos at my Starbucks in the near future. <laughs> I love that you you go with that because that's a topic we talked about the other day was, and I'll ask you, we'll get started. As everybody knows, like I said in the previous, you know, David is the executive director over at Bull TV, an amazing network you need to go check out. Uh, but, you know, it's funny with the NBA starting, do you think they're going to be able to be just a, a, athletes in general? You put people in a bubble. Do you really think these guys are going to behave? I mean, in general, uh, you know. I might have an opinion about this that might not be so popular, although I have a lot of friends who agree with me. I don't think anyone behaves. You know, I social distance, I wear a mask, and I still fail at several points in the day. So I think it's impossible for us to be perfect, and really, we can mitigate our risk but live in a perfect bubble. That's impossible. Yeah. It is funny that they expect him to do that, but like Damian Lillard from the Portland Trailblazers said, he's like, we're going to do our best, but we are human, and if you're going to keep us there for three months, nobody's just going to stay in their hotel. These are their friends. I mean, we're all the same way. I mean, you got to think about it. I don't care how much money these guys have. Come on, you're in Orlando, and you're like, hey, we want you to stay right here. You can't go to Disney. can't go to any of the theme parks. can't go out into Kissimmee. You can't go any. Yeah, right. Those guys are sneaking out, and they're like, what are you going to do? Force me to go back home? Okay, I'll yeah, be cool. and, and, and in Florida, you know, my gym back home, the gym in Celebration is open. So, you know, <laughs> I a lot of people are just pretending like it's not a problem. Here, if you don't live in the tri-state area, here in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, gyms and restaurants haven't opened. So restaurants, indoor dining in New York City has been shelved indefinitely, as have gyms. Mm. That's That's got to be... That's got to be tough because, number one, food in New York is second to none. Shout out to every amazing restaurant I've ever. You know, I was watching Billions the other night, and they were eating at Red Farm. And I was like, man. I had the best burger for lunch. I feel like <laughs> New York burgers are underrated. I had it right before I got online with you. And let me tell you, the food here still exists because we have takeout. Remember. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got everybody's uh, delivering now. I've seen Rao's open and, you know, just uh, I, I guess at least we get to eat good if we're in New York. So, so David, let's talk about streaming TV or social media, you know, social online TV. We see a lot of networks out there. BuzzFeed was basically the godfather of it. And now you see Bold TV really jumping into there. I, I've, I was introduced to Bold TV from our good mutual friend Pavlina Asta. Just amazing network. You've had a couple of folks that we work with on your show or on your network. What is the appeal? What makes Bull TV different from all these other... I mean, number one, your brand seems to be amazing and good guests, high level, and it's available on social, which I think is unique where so many are available on TV. So what makes you guys unique to so many else and, and, and growth-wise? So Bolt TV was built to use Facebook Live, which back in the Stone Ages, you know, aka five years ago, that was a big thing, right? And we really built our brand around social media. And that's unusual even by BuzzFeed standards because really BuzzFeed became popular because of social media. So Bolt TV is different in that we are storytellers and we like to tell stories through interviews. So basically we're a little bit of the new in terms of that we're socially native, which means we were built from the ground up with social media in mind, but we're old in the sense that we resemble more like a Larry King and a lot of guest-driven shows of yesteryear that you really don't see anymore. I mean, I guess, Eric, you have a show that is very guest-driven, but these days we mostly hear talking heads telling us exactly what to think. And we really try to move away from that and try to have people, especially entrepreneurs, newsmakers, and change makers, tell their story. I think that's, I love that you say that because that is so true. And I think, I mean, it's the number one reason. Hold on, I got to fix one thing before we keep going. I zoomed in on you and I need to zoom out before I respond. There we go. When we're side by side, you probably don't want to see your pores on the TV. So <laughs> there you go. But it's interesting that you you bring that up when you talk about talking heads. And I think 
so many networks are guilty of this where it's the same people saying the same almost script. I mean, you can literally follow them around the dial and see the same script, same thing said over and over again. And you do. You do cover entrepreneurs, which I think are so key. And so many shows went away from having guest driven new guests, fresh faces. I mean, come on. How many people have heard of Pavlina that haven't heard of Pavlina, but need to. I mean, that's kind of the way I look at it. Is she's so amazing for a young journalist doing what she's doing and been doing it for years. But Bull TV, you guys put her on and I thought that was amazing to see her on there because she's just so talented. And you do put all these great entrepreneurs on. I mean, why do you think so many networks are still stuck on the talking heads? Is it just comfortable and easy? Or, I mean, it seems easier to get guests now more than ever because we're all stuck at home. Well, it's economics, really, Eric, and really uh, punditry and talking heads is a really cheap way to make content. And in fact, when Bold TV was a for-profit venture, it was really going down that path. Fortunately, we've transitioned to a non-profit model, which really eliminates a lot of the economic pressure. But it's really telling to everyone, anyone, anywhere who owns a media brand, that creating content is very expensive. And if you're looking to make money from it, it's an uphill battle. <laughs> that is an understatement to somebody who has a show. I, I feel you on that one because people have no idea what goes into producing this, uh, um, getting this show out, making sure it's socially done right, having a staff. I mean, even as a small show, we have a staff of five, which is crazy. That Oh, which is nothing, yeah, right? I mean, tiny. at Bold TV right now, we have five. I'm sorry, I counted yesterday, six core employees who assist me directly and report to me. And then we have so many freelancers that I've lost count, Eric. I don't know. Somewhere between 15 and 20. So, and every day we're larger. Oh, and that's good. Growing is, is good. So when it comes to media, and we've all been digesting it, let, 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 let's skip media. Let's talk about developing your own content. I think that is so key because so many people are doing that. You're seeing this micro network, micro shows popping up all over the hemisphere, people on Roku, Amazon Fire, people are creating content. It's not hard. I mean, even you see the can, uh, the camera manufacturers like Canon and Sony making their products now web streaming capable, so you can plug in and produce high quality, ten, you know, the best quality video that you can pull out. Amateurs are doing this now. So, you know, how important is it to develop your own content and get your own voice? Are you technically copying people when you develop something like a show? Are we helping out? With all this content, does it help you guys out or hurt? You know, I've really strayed away from being a personality. I am someone who happens to have a lot of opinions on everything, but I've always really driven the brand to be more channeling other people's stories, which is much more in the style of classic journalism. I am facing a lot of pressure these days to really make uh, myself more known to the world and the audience. Uh, people who know me would say, that my brand is more economic orientated. Um, I am not really someone who partakes of the culture war and all of that. So we're thinking about starting more of a content around consumer defense, financial literacy, et cetera, which is something, a cause that is near and dear to my heart. But to answer your question, the only way to make your own content if you're not telling other people's unique stories is to tell your own unique story. And that's a really important part of differentiating yourself from all the noise everywhere because everyone and their grandmother and their dog has their own show because a lot of the barriers for creating your own content have come crashing down in recent years. That, that's true. And, it, and it's funny, you did bring up Facebook earlier, Facebook Live, which is on the forefront of just pushing content and going live. People love doing it. At any time you could turn on and there's something going on and you're seeing a lot of network shows move over to that. Even the big dogs in mainstream media are really trying to get into that space, but they're not getting the views, which is funny if you look at Facebook and you're like, wow, they don't have that crazy audience. It's like their audience won't follow. And why do you think that is? Why do you think Bull TV? Well, it's weird. In one way, social media is becoming more like television. And in another way, television is becoming more like social media. True. So, if you were around five years ago, right, it was really easy to grow your following because the social media platforms were just looking for eyeballs, right? And in today's world, social media is very much a pay-for-play business. If you do want to grow your audience, et cetera, you have to pay for it, which resembles television, 
right? <laughs> Television, if you put a show on, if you pay for time, you can put, people don't know that if you have enough money, you can buy any slot on television and have your show viewed, right? And you offset that with advertisers, et cetera. Now, in the same vein, social media or television is becoming more like social media because it needs to be a bit more interactive, on demand, et cetera, and things that consumers are now demanding because they've gotten so used to consuming their content on the social media platforms. Yeah, and, and that's and that's great. So that brings up my next question for you. When we talk about, you know, do you think this is the wave of the future? Uh, micro shows, attack, you know, with shows are becoming more and more looking like broadcast TV, but only on YouTube or Facebook, which YouTube is a beast all in its own. I've uh, oh, yes. I've gone down that rabbit hole and I'm addicted. I absolutely love it. Uh, I think it's the closest to having your own channel. I know that there's money, you know, it becomes like a network because you are, you can monetize it, you know, SEO, you care about your viewers, you, quality is a huge thing where a lot of Facebook lives, quality goes out the door. A lot of people are just like, hey, I'm here. Nobody's wearing makeup. They have bright, shiny ring lights in their face. And they're like, hey, how you doing? You know, it's tilted camera. No, you know, or they're getting green screen and they have all that stuff that goes on behind them when they have the green screen growing, which always cracks me up. So do you think this is a wave of the future? Do you think this is going to affect, I mean, Bull TV, you guys seem to be in the spot because you're on social prime, you know, that's your spot. Do you see that growing and networks on their traditional streaming cable and all that? Do you see it that going towards what Bold is instead of the other way around, kind of the traditional journalism oh, yeah. changing? And, and you know why you mentioned Pavlina earlier. That's really why I brought her on. Never mind that she's also a native Floridian like you and me, and I'm a big <laughs> fan of my own people. But, you know, she is Gen Z, and Gen Z doesn't even own television. Mm -hmm. So it's not even of if, it's a matter of when everything's going to transition to, you know, phones and computers. And the way we consume content has already changed, yeah. and that's not going to go backwards. So I think it's a relentless march toward that. And that's why you see the big boys really interested in social media. Now, your question about whether everyone can have their own show and that's the wave of the future, I think it's mixed. I'm thinking of my friend Philip. Philip is someone who I gifted him my ring light because he didn't have one. And his show gets so many views every week because Philip is an interesting man who likes to talk about wealth creation in minority communities. And he has this massive audience and his show is not cosmetically very appealing, but the content is very good. I think it's mixed, Eric. I think people will watch micro shows, but they're not going to leave big media behind. Big media still is the elephant in the room and will continue to be, no matter where you watch it, whether it's on the computer or on television. So that leads me to this. So advertisers have, a lot of in the advertising world is talking about how they pulled away from <clears throat> the big networks. They're not involved in... One network in particular is losing, Facebook. yeah, due to Facebook. And, and you also have, you know, sh there's a controversial conservative talk show host on a big network who just loves he, <laughs> number one ratings. You know who I'm talking about. We're not going to mention Tucker this. Carlson. Yes, Mr. Carlson. Yes. You know, Mr. Tucker, yeah. who he just can't shy away from any controversy that he probably shouldn't dip his foot in the pool. First was Black Lives Matter. And then recently he decided to take on the entire veteran community all by himself, which was just a winning idea. Because if you've learned anything in our country, yeah, veterans are kind of pushy when you start telling us that you can't call somebody who had their legs blown off by an IED. I'm sorry, you can't call them any you're, names. You're Moron is not a name. Duckworth. Huh? Yeah, the yeah. senator from Illinois, correct. Yeah, yes. you just don't do that. You know, uh, Duckworth is an amazing senator and uh, Purple Heart recipient, lost both her legs for her country. Yeah. Well, Tucker's my neighbor. You know, Fox News is right here around the corner. And, you know, I was a big fan of Tucker's when he was on Crossfire a zillion yeah. years ago. For us old people remember when Tucker still wore bow ties. But Tucker's definitely changed in recent years. He, he has. I mean, do you see advertisers flowing towards more towards your guys' side, like Bull TV, because that's where the audience is at? I, I'll tell you, I have a 16, almost 16-year-old. 16 she watches Bull TV. She was excited when we've... You know, when we talked about other folks that, you know, Melissa Ambrosini's been on your show. My daughter's familiar with Melissa. She's just from, you know, she knows Pavlina because there's not a big age gap between the two of them. But <laughs> they, I mean, I asked my daughter and it's, you know, I was talking to Brian Fanzo, who is a big social media person talking about lives. And we were talking about Bull TV. 
and that audience is perfect. You guys do have the, you know, obviously millennials are there, but, you know, Pavlina's generation's there. And then our generation, those of us in our, you know, late 30s, mid 40s, Bull TV is actually where you want to get your news because you've been. Uh, I'm not in my late 30s, Eric. My birthday is next week, but I'm still, I guess next week I will be in my late 30s. So I guess you're the first one to discover that. I'm 36 years old next I was, week. So I was you giving go. you, I, I was just saying all of, I mean, I didn't, uh, now I feel bad. No, now I'm the host that guessed the age of the. I wasn't trying to be right. I, I was. I, don't, I, don't, I, 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 I'm delighted to be in my late 30s. I wear it like a badge of honor. Happy to be here. That's Been how. Here that's how I feel about my mid 40s. I love it. I look fabulous, and I'm gonna take that to the bank and, and love it that I enjoy life. And I get told that I don't look my age, so I'll take that any day of the week. So same with you. You do not look like you are 36. So. Yeah, I'm fine with it either way. I think uh, if we want to be honest about this stuff, I think as males, it's a little easier to age. And my heart goes out to all my, you know, sisters in life who, you know, aging with children is a lot more complex than it is for males. My so wife's yelling amen from another room. So yeah. <laughs> she, she agrees with you 100%. No, but, uh, you know, how do you see this prevailing with shows targeting the right audience? Clearly, Bold TV... Just like BuzzFeed back in the day, you targeted the right audience, you get the right eyeballs, and you have the right guests. It's not the, I mean, you're right, the elephant in the room, the big boys, you know, Fox right around the corner, CNN over there in Hudson Yard. Nobody's going to knock them it off. Their... The other way. Yeah. And actually, NBC is like in, like that way. Yeah. I can throw a rock at all three of them. They're all here. Sweet. So. I, and that's... I mean, nobody's going to take those guys down, but you could take a big portion of their market share if you make your audience user friendly. And, you know, NBC's kind of the big dog because they've been here the longest. <laughs> they're NBC. They, they're they never going to go away. You can lose cable and you'll still have NBC, ABC, and CBS. You'll be just fine. And, now, and, and, and let me tell you, I can go on and on about the perils of big media, but if I had to praise one company, it would be NBC Comcast. I've met the, chair, the new chairman of NBC, Cesar Conde. He's a great guy. He, their values are in the right place. Their heart is in the right place. I just don't feel like we're vying for the same audience, which is exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, and they're, I they're big. Like, I mean, you got to think about their audience is, Yeah, <laughs> it's everybody. I mean, they're, I mean, they're competing with the, I always laugh when people say, when I've ever said NBC or ABC, or, and they're like, people go on those shows. I'm like, who do you think watches the Today Show, Good Morning America, and CBS Good Morning? They have a very large audience. I mean, there's a reason why Good Morning America has their building in Times Square. Uh, they're not dumb. I mean, all three of those networks produce such good content. Um, I think cable news, unfortunately, is feeding, which NBC owns one of those brands, yeah. MSNBC, is feeding into this narrative that Americans are either far left and far right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's true. And I think I've used my own platform to really say, hey, we should rethink this whole we're so different that we can't talk to each other. So we've really made a concerted effort to bring people together who wouldn't otherwise talk to each other and make sure that they leave that conversation recognizing each other's humanity and commonalities, which a lot of times are greater than their differences. And that's something we don't see a lot in today's media narrative. I, I love that you said that, and that's a good transition point for us here. So <laughs> again, here you are at Bold TV, and uh, the biggest elephant in the room while we're talking about elephants is election 2020. Obviously, you're going to have to cover it. You can't, like, ignore it. It is a huge sure. story. And you're right. I think Bold TV, out of many of the shows that are on, you go down the middle and you actually report both sides, which I think is key. In so many of the cable news networks, they pick a side, and that's the way they're rolling, and there's no way to make it look bipartisan like they're actually doing journalism like the great walter cronkite in those before where sure. it was i mean there's good people yeah. i'm a big fan of neil cabuto at mm -hmm. fox i think chris cuomo does good work you know obviously msnbc is a powerhouse yeah. i just don't want to feed into the narrative that americans are all that different i think most americans care about economic issues and their ability to thrive and just for government to really leave them alone unless otherwise necessary. So I guess I would fall into a, a, a libertarian slash free, free market person, but you know, a live and let live, let people lead their lives. We're not here to tell them how they need to live them. I mean, I think that's good that Bull TV has that mission, right? Like not to pick a side. And I really don't like that. I, and you're right. Neil is one of the great ones. Uh, 
you know, there's, I mean, Fox does have a good cast. Anderson Cooper is one of my favorite journalists on the planet, just the way that he covers things. Uh, and I'm a big Jake Tapper fan also. I mean, I think they oh, all have, fantastic. they're of all course. fantastic yeah. journalists. I just wish that we had more news and different, it goes back to what we started our conversation on, talking heads that are on every network that show up and I'll pick on them. Usually crusty old white guys are there and they're telling you about how it's like on social media when most of them don't even have social accounts. They all have Twitter and parlor accounts. That's the new thing. Something changed. You know, someone who I greatly admire in the world is Wolf Blitzer. Mm -hmm. And I was watching him last night. I actually have cable right now because I uncord cut because of this pandemic. <laughs> and I'm surprised at how much opinion is in there. I would be so interested to go back 20 years ago and it was Wolf, same guy. Mm -hmm brilliant man one of my favorites on tv how much of his opinion was injected into that show yeah. i think it's changed mm -hmm. and i i have i if my memory serves me right and eric you're older than me maybe you can help me i don't remember cnn being like that 20 years ago no bernard shaw i think one of the best i mean voices of our youth when you think about it. i remember i remember listening to bernard shaw back in the day cnn gulf war starting sitting in our house in Folsom, California, right after we, we moved. We were all there. I remember that, of course. And Bernard Shaw, that smooth, milky, beautiful voice that man had. I mean, and too, he's a vet. I mean, just an amazing... Him telling that, and I forget the Englishman that was on the ground in Baghdad reporting, and we couldn't, we couldn't see anything. We could just hear him. I just remember that. And you're right. You take that back to the Gulf War, and you go ahead... There wasn't all this like, oh my goodness, this or that. No, it was like we supported America. Even journalism at 9-11 time, we weren't this divided that we are now where each network who has amazing talent has changed the way that they actually report. And it's just so, I don't like slanted news. I'm like, tell a story. And perfect example here, David, and I'll give it, and all of our viewers know I've been very passionate about this, of uh, Vanessa Guillen. And Army, she's a soldier in the Army, was a soldier in the Army. She went missing over 70 days yes. ago. And they, Familiar, yes. And they found her dead body just last week and, and confirmed yeah. it this earlier this week. Mainstream media wouldn't cover it. Period. End of sentence. No matter the list. It was so weird. And here I am, and I'm directly calling friends of mine going, well, dude, just questioning, just asking, why isn't this getting attention? <laughs> And the answer is, ah, well, there's a lot going on. I'm like, there's a lot going on, yes, but this is a Latino woman who went missing from a base that has beyond a small issue with, when they were looking for her, they found two other dead soldiers. I mean, it's just randomly kind of like, this is a news story. Why do you think this kind of, is it the election? Is it because everything is going on at the I same mean, time? It goes ignored? You know, and I, and, I, and I hate when people blame the media. I am the media, yeah. and I think we all have a tough job, including these superstars. Even Anderson Cooper, his job is not easy, yeah. and people are going to come out of the woodwork to criticize him when this is tough work, folks. But I understand what you're saying as well, is that a lot of times big media doesn't give a platform to voices. Yeah. That's where Bold TV comes in. Yeah. As you know, Eric, because you do earned media like me, Eric and I go to other networks and do appearances mm -hmm. as talking heads, right? And we, there's not a lot of room for a lot of outside voices in mainstream media or stories that really don't fit into the tsunami of the current news cycle. Yeah. And I think it's definitely a problem, but it has a lot to do with the economics and the limited bandwidth that even these massive organizations have to cover absolutely everything that's going on. All right. So that makes sense. I just wanted to get it out there because I had a lot of people going, what, Eric, you're in the media? And I'm like, yeah, I talk about sports. Uh, and they're like, but <laughs> you could have brought up Vanessa while you're talking about sports. I'm like, mm, no, I can't. I mean, that, was, that was a terrible, terrible yes. story. And, you know, unfortunately, that shouldn't be happening. And, you know, I think both people on the left and the right see that there is a lot of room for a reform needed in our military, and it is the nation's most important institution. So it's something that should be at the forefront of our concerns. Yeah, I mean, it's scary. I mean, we had a show uh, the weekend, two weekends ago, the weekend before July 4th, when we were the when Vanessa hit. I was covering the story like a week after Vanessa disappeared because Military Times was covering it. Obviously, military pubs are really good at covering our own missing. And started deep diving into the story. So two weeks ago, it really we started getting contacted by lots of people going, 
do you know that there's a list? They sent me a list of nine soldiers, women, that went missing from Fort Hood. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Is this a Netflix yeah, special? Am I, am I in a dream and I'm in a Netflix special right now? Is this Unsolved Mysteries happening in real life? So we had this. I mean, don't even joke about that. We've all seen Tiger King and all the other crazy Netflix specials that have come along. Right. <laughs> which, by the way, speaking of which, they are content creators too. They're in our same line of work and they're doing a great job in giving platforms to these people who need a voice yeah. like and, this poor woman who yeah. went missing and all these people who aren't getting the attention that they need. So how, do, so here's a, here's a, here's the million dollar question since you work in this and by no means am I attacking the media. Yeah. I went after a few uh, on the certain side who will preach to you how much they love country and support our troops. I think part of the frustration, especially amongst the veteran and military community is uh, when it comes to a lot of networks, and I'm just speaking my mind here, and it's what I do on the show from time to time. Sure. Speak the Eric mind. Uh, is I don't I don't get a, I don't get offended easily, so I'm not one of these like snowflakes. You can tell me as it is. I love Please. it, David. You're welcome on our show anytime. I love it when people are like they're not <laughs> snowflakes. But the big key is why do you think? And this is a perception. The media seems to love the military when it's November, which is of course Veterans Day. And they love us in May. And May is kind of cool. May, we start May off, not with just Mother's Day, but we have Military Spouse Appreciation Day, which they are a key. And I'm loving to see more and more networks focusing on our mill spouse and at least interviewing them, talking about what they go through, because they truly are on the front lines back home. Of course. Dealing with stuff. And then Memorial Day comes. And for some reason, some people in the media mistake Memorial Day for Veterans Day, and which <laughs> which causes a huge divide. But then... It's like this lull between November and May and May to November, where if there's a story that deals with something going bad in the military, uh, which seems to be happening with you know Vanessa's case, it goes unheard. I think that's where the frustration goes. It's like, wait a minute. You're the first person, and I'm not going to call out people, but there are particular anchors on TV that will tell you, number one, their prior service, and two, how much they support the troops. And this is a, a, a popular stance with so many. And it's like, okay. We're not asking you to cover the story. How about you retweet the story? How about you just share on your Twitter, which people respond to, and it goes ignored, which adds to the frustration, and we get it. There's a lot. Our country's like a gigantic. 2020 is a dumpster fire. Let's just face it. We've got COVID. Oh, yeah. the, the you know civil rights, again, has flared its head, where most of us who were not alive in the 60s, I was not. I, I Nowhere near the 60s was I born. Just want to... Make sure everyone knows my age is nowhere near the 60s. <laughs> it's okay if you were born in the 60s, folks. That's but, fine, too. But I was not, damn it. I don't know the civil rights. I know civil rights from Netflix. I, I mean, I've learned a lot from that in history books. But, you know, we have a lot going on. And then you add this on top of it. Our country does love its soldiers. And I think a lot of the arguments that went back and forth. And I'm just picking on this case because I find it funny. And I, I have a question. Trust me, I'll get to it in this long-winded Ericism. But, you know, if, it, if Vanessa was a blonde girl... I think some networks would have been at the front gate of Fort Hood. I mean, some people have Nancy Grace on their payroll, yet she didn't cover the story. And I think I think part of the question is this, David. Do you think it's harder for news right now during COVID-19 because the staff is shorter? They're not in their offices. They're working remote. The stories, the news seems to break at any given moment. And someone really likes Twitter a lot. And that kind of changes the way it goes. There's a particular person who loves Twitter and cap locks and tweets quite uh. often. Yeah, we know you're, who you're yeah. talking about. Listen, Twitter's not the real world, folks. No. Only journalists live on Twitter, <laughs> and I want to just clear that up. I have many friends that are part of the Twitterati, and I constantly remind them that what they do isn't real. Um, so, second of all, um, I think that media is hard. Yeah. And, you know, the economics of media, yeah, a blonde woman going missing is gets advertising dollars because that's the demographic that a lot of people are looking for. Yeah. You know, diversity matters, equity matters. You know, I grew up in the ethnic enclave in Miami. I'm Cuban American, but I present as, you know, this, you know, white bread male. So <laughs> I try to, you know, integrate that into my thinking and my coverage, et cetera, and giving these people a voice. And I, I think it all comes back to this, is that sometimes with media, we have a dual mandate, which is for those of us that are for profit, it's to make money, right? But at the same time, we have the public's trust at stake. And I think a lot of people tend to forget that when people need coverage for their cause or change, and change is hard, especially with big, burly organizations like the Department of Defense. So. Yeah. 
I think it's really easy to find problems with the military that need attention that everyone's ignoring right now. Yeah, that, that's true. So l- l- let's jump from that. I don't I don't want the hate mail that I already can feel that I'm going to get for daring to say half the things <laughs> I say. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. So f- for Bull TV, uh, let's talk about diversity. It's key. There's a lot of networks that do a great, a great job on it, and there's some jo- networks that do a really poor job on it. Uh, you guys do a good job. It's very diverse. How much of that is a focus for you guys, even beforehand? I think before everything that blew up in our country when, and it's not just George Floyd. I hate it when people say hey, George Floyd caused this. No, Breonna Taylor was killed long before. We can go back. It's a, it's a light. It's a lightning rod. Yeah, but, you know. But yeah. you guys kind of led the way. I, I noticed that when we were in studio in February. Uh, it was my first time being around Bold, like, in studio, and I was amazed by the diversity. And there, it's the smaller networks, smaller shows I noticed that are really focused on that. How big is that now for you guys moving forward as you as you talk about growing and having all these freelancers? How much is that a focus for programming, guests that you're putting on, stories that you're covering? Well, you know what's funny is people think that it takes effort. In fact, if you have a diverse staff, and that includes everyone, diversity doesn't mean excluding anyone. Everyone's welcome to the party. Diversity kind of takes care of itself, right? You know, I don't have a problem get black guests because my booker, my primary booker, Cheyenne, is black, right? But then the other booker is a big white guy from upstate New York. So it's like their networks feed into what we do. And diversity is not something that you even have to focus on if you hire the right people. And by no means am I hiring people to check off a box. I'm hiring the best people. But they happen to be from many walks of life. And guess what? I'm then instantaneously connected to their networks. And then it's not a monolith. This is a very diverse country in every way, shape, and form. Urban, rural, racial, ethnic, religion. Every sense of the word. And we try to make sure that we are not promoting a singular narrative and trying to include as many people as possible. I love that. See, you, you have, I like interviewing you, David. You answer the question. Mm-hmm. You don't, you don't, some people dance around when I ask that question because I think it's a key. I mean, I understand what you're talking about. It's interesting. You brought up being raised in Miami, being a Cuban American. I understand that. But a lot of people, when you leave Florida, have no idea what I'm talking about. If we were to talk about, I know when I moved from Orlando to Folsom, California, Number one, I had never heard Johnny Cash in my life till I moved to Folsom, and somebody goes, Johnny Cash wrote a song, and being moving to Folsom and doing my school, my high schooling there, was a whole different world for me. California had, you know, it was different. You know, I grew up around, you know, Cuban Americans and Puerto Ricans. Whereas the world, I mean, I knew, I didn't know that there was any other Spanish besides the bad words that I learned from <laughs> my Puerto Rican friends. <laughs> <laughs> our fast and comprehensible Spanish. Yes, like uh, mita 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 was the word that I knew instantly. That was like oh, so Puerto Rican. Yeah, 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 yeah. straight up yeah. in moving to California, which was new for us. So I mean, cultures are different, but how do we continue to? I'm not saying focus on diversity. Like, oh my God, we need to plug away. But I get what you're talking about. I mean, by by your appearance, which is weird for people to appear. You shouldn't have to give your bio that I'm not a white guy. I'm a Cuban American. That to me, kind of, I think we need to. Well, it's even more complex than that because yeah. our version of white is different than the U.S.'s version of white. Listen, yeah. race is all made up, folks, but it's something that you know dictates our trajectory in life. Absolutely. So it is important. At the same time, it's not important at all. So I think with diversity and a lot of stuff like that, it's common sense. You need buy-in from everyone, right? You need buy-in from majority ethnic groups, like white people. Yeah. I mean, it's an indispensable part of the solution. So I try to create an environment where everyone is welcome and to be themselves. And by being themselves, they bring their networks, they bring their people, they bring their worldview, and therefore, I don't have to worry about it. It just kind of happens. I love it. So let, let, let's ask a cool business question. We get asked this a lot, and I told folks that you were coming on the show. So some people sent in some questions and one of them was interesting. So a lot of people, they are growing their business or they're they're a sizable entrepreneur with a following and they have a great story. And I ask everybody who works at the network this question. It's one of my favorite. I know the answer, but I'd love for you to say it because coming out of my mouth, they're like, well, you don't work at the network. What do you know? Kind of tell people if they're going to send it, there's nothing wrong with pitching your bookers, pitching your news desk. Nothing wrong with you guys like that because fresh stories. Not of course. 
I mean, bookers, you guys are inundated. If people don't know what bookers life is, it's like being lit on fire every morning trying to find everybody. You've got 8 million emails and everybody wants a response. Of course. I mean, it's kind of a knucklehead, com you know, it drives publicists nuts. It drives media people nuts. Like, hey, I'm sending you something. Are you going to respond to my email? And after years, you kind of figure out they'll let you know and the secret is actually text people and then you get a faster response. But then you have to build that relationship. So for folks, six page essays, four pitches, they don't work anywhere, correct? Kind of <laughs> give what, tell the folks what you prefer. I, I think we need someone to, besides me, I've had other folks, other, you know, especially senior bookers at other networks. That they're like, dude, I don't need the constitution sent to me. <laughs> like short. Yeah, sweet, no, I call that a papyrus scroll. It's like cuneiform, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the beginnings of civilization. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the best thing is storytelling is all about communicating as fast as possible. We live in a world where no one has the attention span to sit around and read a papyrus scroll, the preamble to the Constitution, etc. <laughs> so get straight to the point and be very parsimonious with your words. And a lot of times, remember, follow the news cycle right? So if you can speak to something that is hot right now, it's even better. But moreover, sometimes something that's off the news cycle might be good as well. As you mentioned, Eric, the booking process is very random. People take it personally when, you know, emails aren't responded to, but the demand for media far exceeds the supply. So you have to be patient and tenacious. Ask our friend Pavlina about that. She writes pitches every morning. That's how she starts her day. Yeah. And she's been met with a lot of success. Yeah, and that's true. And I think that is a big key that so many people don't get. This is repetition. I mean, my team does this on the LifeLit media side every morning. I mean, they go out. I, I see all the emails go out. And, you know, even I send them out. I mean, a lot of mine are different now. I'm, uh, I'm a, I am text half the people I know and be like, hey, I'm sending you this. And that's how I do it. But to get started, I think a lot of people out there, we have a lot of home-based businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs who are used to being on the speaking circuit. They're available, but they've never thought about media. And now is the time because you guys actually, <laughs> you have to do remotes now. Uh, and I know that's- and I, and, I wanna, and I wanna remind your audience of something is that never leave your local outlets on the table. I worked in Orlando and in Amarillo, Texas as a journalist and when you send a pitch for something as an entrepreneur, include another contact because, as you know, in television journalism, you have to interview two people. If you do the story for them, you're going to get a lot of traffic. And people, believe it or not, still watch local news. And they also have a big digital footprint, so that can help promote your business or whatever organization or whatever forays you're into. So never leave local media on the table. They're a powerful tool. And in fact, with local media, you can work your way up to national media. I love that you said that because so many people want to skip and I always laugh because they're like, I pitched the news desk at Bull, Cheddar, Fox, CNN. And I'm like, have you ever done media before? I was on a podcast. Okay. Well, did you try local? Did you try right down the street first? No. So I do I do radio once a month. Yeah. I've been doing it for four years now. I, radio. I do it for Fox Radio. It's really fun, by the yeah, way. I love radio. I wake up literally two minutes before my interview, and I have perfected the art of being on radio half asleep and sounding good. So I have to remind you folks, if you've been on a podcast, it's not the same as TV. TV's a lot harder. Oh, yeah, that's true. And, and radio, let's talk about radio, because we both do radio. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it. I tell everybody they should I do it. it. Radio's love radio's not dead. Let let's be clear. It's no. It's a huge platform. And I love it because they put me on a radio tour and I get to talk to people from around the country. One of the problems we have in today's world is that basically I only go to New York, California, and Florida. So I really unless I talk to my cousins in Missouri, I basically just fly over the flyover states. And I love talking to the DJs in Birmingham and in Columbia, South Carolina and in Virginia Beach, and in Lansing, Michigan, and really getting the pulse of what people think and how they're interpreting the hot button issues of the day. Yeah, and that's true, that's the great thing. I'm, I'm with you, I like doing those same ones. Like, 
Uh, there's one in Champaign, Illinois, and kind of bouncing around like I've been yeah, like oh, yeah. <laughs> like Louisiana and all those kind of like. Just yesterday, oh, yeah. I did the Chip Franklin show in San Francisco, which is cool because I'm you know growing up in Folsom, California, and then living in the Bay, working in the Silicon Valley for so many years. That was like. It's cool to talk about the 49ers and things that you know about that you're just like, yay, I'm in the Bay. And I love that because you go to different cities, you hear what they're going through, the questions that they're dealing with. you know. And I talk about sports, not politics at all. And it's fun to see how cities are reacting to sports starting back up. I, I know New York, it's huge. The Yankees have been you know, doing training at, the, at an empty stadium and people are tuning in. Speaking of killer Facebook views, they're killing it with their live streams. Oh, that they well, do. of course. Yankees yeah. are very popular, Eric. Yeah. I don't think that's ever going to change. No, I, mean, I just think it's amazing. People are watching. The sport. Yeah. I mean, it's to me, and I'll ask you that, and then I have one more, and then we'll let you go. But, you know, one of the big questions I always see is, do you think, for sports-wise, you are you obviously run a network. My big question is this. I don't think there's going to be a big issue. With people are going to still tune in and watch sports streaming on tv and it's money for advertising because we're going to be glued to it whether it's on tv or on our streaming devices do you think there's going to be an issue there or do you think it's just going to be a monster you know eric i'm not even a big sports person i'm one of those people who you know watch the u.s open and the super bowl and everything and i'll tell you this drought of sports has made me appreciate once we what we once had and i don't think sports are going away you know the Romans always said, give them bread and give them circus, right? Mm. You got to eat and you got to be entertained. And there is, quite frankly, nothing more entertaining than sports for the bulk of people all around the world. So I think that is never going to go away. Sports is the language of humanity. One of my good friends is uh, Leonard Tosa's granddaughter, the guy who owned the Philadelphia Eagles. And she always says, sports is the universal language, and I don't think that will ever change. No, that, and I agree with you, because if you saw what happened in, was it May, when they released the Michael Jordan documentary? I mean, people lost their minds watching Last Dance. I mean, ESPN had better ratings than they did during normal sports season, because we're so thirsty for sports. I mean, tuning in and watching, I mean, I brought up the Yankees because I was amazed. I've watched a lot of stuff on their feed, because I'm a diehard Yanks fan, and watching that feed and go, wow, people are watching batting practice. And normally, you go back and look a year ago, batting practice wouldn't get that many views. It wasn't like millions yeah, of people well, sitting there. And now people are like, I want to watch it. I don't care. I'm just going to have it on just because. I don't care what I'm watching. I and mean, what was the crazy sport that they had on in the middle of the pandemic that everyone was watching because they were so bored? What was it? They had one boxing match. Yeah. And then there was some other odd sport. I mean, people were getting desperate there for a second. I think curling would have been number one at that point. Anything, anything. Yeah, I just, just saw. Something to watch. I just saw right before we went on air, somebody sent me a piece, and it was from Japanese baseball, the, the amazing Japanese baseball league. And because they don't have fans, they put robots out in the outfield and they're doing this robot dance it's like okay the Japanese are really and yeah. you know much like cubans puerto ricans americans they love baseball and they're gonna make it japanese with robots i japan's a fascinating country and leave it to them to create right? a robotic baseball game you're just like there's <laughs> robot fans out in the outfield cheering they have ipads around their <laughs> neck and then there's like these little like four-legged like animal looking robots and they're like shaking their butts and i'm like only and it's because they have flags on them i'm like okay there you go america we've raised we're raising the level for our sports watching it'll be interesting when baseball starts at the end of july i mean everything kind of starts it's tv sports we're getting it like out of a fire hose come the end of this month and then we have the nfl hey, starting thank god Thank yeah. God. A lot of jobs are on the line. A lot of people depend on that. It's not just the players. Think about everyone that lives off sports. You know, okay. I think it's really important not only to entertain, you know, our fellow citizens and the world for that matter, but also all these people that are connected to that industry. We need them to come back. Absolutely. So, David, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been great. I love being able to pick somebody, especially at the network level, pick your brain about so much that's going on. And we covered my favorite topic, which was radio is not dead. So many people are like, I don't want to do radio. And I'm always telling people, do radio. They're super thirsty for content. I, uh, you talked about regional TV. Pitch your regional radio folks. They'll take you in a heartbeat. You have a story and, and something good. good. 
and they're the nicest people. They're so much nicer than television, and honestly, radio makes you good at TV. It's a great starting point. So true. So I want to thank you uh, for joining us today, and uh, we'll be back right after these messages. Let's get to the point.